It is now. Good afternoon, folks. Welcome back after the uh, the 20 minute break. We're just about to start our next session with Pete Bray. Uh, if, you, if this is your first time in, in this room today, then welcome to the HP track. A couple of things I want to share with you about uh, our track today and the presence that we have here in Vancouver for the summit. If you haven't checked out our lounge yet, I definitely highly recommend it. It's on the west side of the building. It has a great view and uh, there's s'mores and some acoustic music as well as uh, you can get some really nice hoodies and uh, get some badges uh, ironed on. So different badges such as you know, for the different projects, there's some different logos and whatnot that they have there so you can customize it. Definitely also, also want to recommend that to you RSVP to our party on Tuesday evening. So if you haven't done so already, the Supernatural party, that's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, next, a uh, little last thing before I hand it over to Pete, is that we have lightning talks following this session. And besides having a bunch of great presenters coming up here and giving five minute quick talks about different, uh, different ideas or calls to action, during that session we'll also be doing a giveaway for a 10 inch Android tablet. So make sure you're, to be here for that. If uh, you're not leaving the room, you're going to stay for that session, just raise your hand after, afterwards and we'll bring you around a raffle ticket for that. So we have uh, amped up OpenStack Swift with uh, Pete. So thank you, Pete. Am I on? Okay, awesome. Thank you, Cody. Um, and welcome today to our session, uh, Amping Up OpenStack Swift. So uh, with me here today also, so I'm Pete Bry. I'm with the uh, Helion OpenStack team at HP. Um, I'm responsible for developing and marketing cloud storage solutions uh, based upon Helion OpenStack. And with me here today, I also have Joseph George. Joseph, uh, can you introduce yourself? Well, you don't have the microphone. <laughs> there you Wouldn't go. need that, yes. <laughs> uh, Joseph George, uh, director uh, in the HP server group um, for big data and storage solutions, uh, specifically around Apollo servers. Um, and I've also been uh, fortunate to serve on the OpenStack board uh, in my past as well. Excellent. Thanks, Joseph. Um, so our discussion here today, and I call it a discussion as opposed to, I'm not going to sit here, and Joseph's not going to sit here and go through slides and tell you about how HP is great. Um, rather, I think we want to get an, a two-way discussion going here. And so I'm going to start it off by just kind of pulling you and getting a little bit of information from you. And coincidentally, we want to keep it kind of informal. So if you have questions, no need to wait till the end. Uh, jump in. Let's get a conversation going. Let's talk about what you want to talk about here. We've got prepared materials, and we're going to go through that. But feel free to jump in. So the first question I'm going to ask is, how many of you out there in the audience have been working on deploying object storage with your OpenStack environment? Cool. Excellent. How many are in production? OK. Interesting. How many of you are using Swift for your OpenStack Cloud storage. Interesting. Okay. Great. Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today is OpenStack Swift and what HP is doing to really make, and if you've ever worked with object storage, you know that it can be a challenge to build these systems and particularly to scale them. Um, and we're going to talk today about what HP is doing to make that experience easier. We have these things at HP that are called cloud optimized solutions. You may have heard of them. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is one that's called Content Depot. We also have another cloud-optimized solution called Helion Rack, which is really meant for uh, rapidly deploying and quickly scaling compute. Uh, what we're going to focus on here today is rapidly deploying and quickly scaling object storage using OpenStack Swift, together with HP hardware, HP services, the, everything that HP has to offer uh, in this particular space. If you do have a question, uh, there's a microphone right there, and Joseph will cover this side of the room too. So please speak into the microphone so everybody can hear the question uh, loudly and clearly. And like I said, interrupt at any point. So we want to talk today about what we've created, this optimized cloud solution uh, called Content Depot. You might say, well, what is an optimized cloud solution? That sounds like a marketing term. Um, really what it is fundamentally is it's a combination of hardware, software, installation services, and even operational knowledge bundled together in a solution that we can provide for you. It includes support. It includes even financing uh, if you're looking to deploy, deploy a private cloud uh, type of solution like this. So it's really an integrated solution meant to be more rapidly deployable and meant to be more easily scalable. 
some of the key features, and as you probably know, if you know anything about uh, Open, uh, OpenStack Swift, uh, it's, mass, it's built for massive scalability from the ground up. Um, <clears throat> we can uh, use this system to provide high availability also with built-in features around replication. Uh, and uh, of course, it also supports the OpenStack Swift API. It's a very scalable system based on HP hardware, and Joseph's gonna talk about some aspects of that, particularly some of the new exciting things that we're doing with HP's Apollo server line uh, that are really gonna bring even further benefits for massively scalable storage like this. But it's also supposed to be simple. And if you've ever built one of these systems, you know that in order to achieve scale, you gotta have simplicity. Uh, you can be eaten alive by the complexities of developing even just a petabyte size system, let alone 40 or 100 petabytes. And so that's one of the things that we've done uh, is we've engineered in some of the simplicity and we continue to uh, hammer away at that. How many of you in the audience are in businesses or industries where you're concerned about security, data security in particular? Yeah, um, it's a big concern and a lot of people deploying these types of systems are very concerned about both uh, data in flight and data at rest. Uh, and with this particular solution, we can provide encryption uh, of both at rest and in flight data. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, a little bit later. And then of course it's open, it's based on OpenStack uh, standards. <clears throat> so let's talk first about one of the major hardware components, which are the servers that go into these solutions. Joseph's gonna talk to us about the new Apollo series, the Apollo 4000 series. Uh, I mentioned security uh, optimized version of this particular reference architecture which supports both data at rest and data encryption uh, using our uh, ProLiant DL360 line together with D6000 storage and uh, a product called an Enterprise Secure Key Manager from HP. So let's go ahead and Joseph, I'll turn it over to you and you can talk about the Apollo series. Sure, thanks Pete. Um, so, um, when it comes to servers, uh, you know, I, I haven't been in the open source communities for a long time. A lot of times you'll just hear, find your favorite general purpose node uh, and uh, multiply it times however big you want your, your cluster to be, right? That's kind of the standard perspective. And that's great. Dell's got, um, you know, HP's got a number of, uh, you know, great, great servers uh, that fit. The, the DL380 is a good example, most popular server in the world. But what, we, what we've started finding is that as you started digging into these use cases, you start finding that general purpose is not always the best fit for specific workloads, okay? Um, so for example, you know, a standard general purpose server will have some compute, some storage. It's a great general purpose, multi-purpose type, uh, uh, type model. But what the, um, what the Apollo 4000 family has started doing is uh, looking at how we actually do storage on a server better than you know gen than what general purpose actually is doing. So, we if you're familiar with the SL4540, is anybody? I know this is not a hardware show, so you may not be familiar. But okay, see a few hands. Uh, when uh, Fox was uh, up here on stage and DreamWorks was on stage, they mentioned they're actually using that in their environment. Is it just me, or is this volume going down? Can you hear me? You can hear me fine. Okay, good. Um, the, the SL4540 right now is one that's uh, being, being used, but what we've done is now that we've started seeing this particular market, you know, customers like you are starting to get uh, how a purpose-built storage platform for, you know, with, with some compute, how it's actually making a difference. We've actually expanded that to a full portfolio of things right now. And so whenever you see an Apollo 4 series server, uh, you, can, you can know that it has to do with data, big data, uh, object stored, et cetera. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time on the Apollo 4200 and the, on the 4510, which we just uh, announced, that are specific to uh, Swift uh, in particular. I won't spend a lot of time on the 4530, but just so you're aware, it's, uh, it's a chassis, it's a 4U chassis that's got three individual compute nodes and then 15 drives associated with each one of those. So if you know anything about Hadoop, when data comes into the cluster, it, it, it replicates it three times. So it works really well in that one chassis and you've got the compute nodes that are there. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on Hadoop, but let's go ahead and get into uh, what these platforms look like, okay? Now, um, when you talk about servers, you talk about you, right, the units. It's the, the, not the, the height of the uh, server in the rack. Um, this is a brand new product, the Apollo 4200. 
Um, most of you are probably using 2U servers. The servers are uh, two, 2U in height. Most of your servers are probably at 15, 16 large form factor drives in that environment. Um, what we have just done is, is rolled out this 4200 that actually can hold 28 large form factor drives in a 2U space. And uh, each one of those drives can actually be uh, up to 8 terabytes. So um, it is a form factor that a lot of folks are very, very comfortable with. Um, it looks a lot like the 380 in terms of its, uh, in t in terms of its uh, height. But what we've managed to do is we actually added an another drive cage to this. We, if you look at the graphic there, um, the front end of that, uh, that server actually slides out. And right behind it, another drive cage. Um, and actually in the back, we actually have another drive cage as well. So you can have, you can have 28 large form factor drives in this one, dri in this one server. Or if you wanted to use small form factor drives, we can use 50 small form factor drives here. What we've done here is really taken that storage data use case and really expanded out. We understand the community likes this form factor. And so what this does now for um, is you can actually have 224 terabytes in that same sort of form factor you've always known and loved. You can now do this in a, in a 2U uh, a form factor, okay? And again, this is the first, uh, first time on the market. And with this uh, solution, uh, when it comes to 2U servers, HP actually has the densest uh, storage server that is in, in, the, in the industry. All right. And finally, we talk about 4510, and then we'll stop talking about servers. Uh, if you're familiar with the 4540, this is the next generation of that. Um, a couple of things that changed. The SL4540, the previous generation, was, a, uh, was 4.3U. And I know a lot of people love that 0.3. Uh, but we've shaved that off. It's actually now an even for you. Uh, why that matters is now we can get 10 of these chassis in a rack now. Um, and so with 10, cha uh, 10, ra uh, 10 chassis in one rack, these, we've also added six extra drives. In the uh, old generation, we can only get 60 drives. Now we're at 68 drives, uh, and each one of those can be 8 terabytes uh, each. And so if we do a little bit of math, 68 drives times 10, you can actually have 5.4 petabytes of capacity in one rack now. Um, and what we're seeing is there's, there's lots of ways to get this kind of storage uh, capacity in your, uh, in your environment, but now we're able to try and get it as dense as possible. A lot of our customers that are uh, using on-prem solutions uh, or are looking at a hybrid solution where some of their uh, OpenStack environment is, uh, is on-premise and some are in the public cloud, um, we're trying to make sure that we're taking as little data center space as possible. And uh, this is some of the innovation that's happening there. Uh, there's a lot when it comes to power savings and when it comes to actual density of the compute. Uh, and I want to be clear, it's not a JBOD. It actually does have compute capabilities on the front of it. Um, and we're working very closely with our Helion teams and the OpenStack community to, uh, to make sure that we're actually trying to drive a more object storage use case for this. So as you start seeing more and more iterations of this coming out, and this is a theme you'll start seeing from HP, particularly in the Apollo line, uh, purpose-built platforms is what you're going to start seeing. So this particular platform, purpose-built for object storage uh, and, you know, storage on a, on a server. Uh, any quick questions on that before I hand it over? I know I went kind of fast on that, but I'll hand it over to Pete. Any questions on that? Yes. Uh, the question was, are all these disks hot swappable? The answer is yes. Um, I will say that there are some other players in the market um, that do something similar to this where um, either you, they're not hot swappable or you have to take a portion of the drives or a whole entire bay down. Not the case here. Each one of these, for both of these models, uh, any drive that needs to be serviced, pop them out, put them back in, no problem. Yes, there was one other question. Yeah, two questions. Uh, do, they, do they support both SAS and SATA drives? Yeah, the question was, uh, do we support both SAS and SATA? Uh, the answer is yes, we support SAS, SATA, and SSD drives in both of these models. And we also support mixing them if you so choose. Um, and again, this goes back to their, you know, this was an early design argument. Why, why would anybody ever mix these? Uh, but now as you start getting into, uh, you know, these new workloads, you do want some better, you know, uh, IO upfront and certain drives. You want to be able to get quick, quick in and out. Other ones you want just to be cheaper drives to store the data. Um, so you can actually use all three types and you can actually mix and match as needed. Okay. Any other questions on that? Yes. Yeah, 4200. So the question was, how does it compare to the DL380? 
Um, so they're very similar. The engineering teams are actually ver the same teams. Um, this particular model was meant specifically for storage. Uh, so the DL380 has uh, a maximum of 15 large form factor drives. And again, it was designed to be general purpose. Any sort of use case you've got, DL380 can probably do a pretty good job of it. Here we, wanted, we recognize what was happening with object storage. We have, recognize what's happening with Hadoop. And we realize everybody's trying to get to a smaller footprint. So it still has ILO. It still has all the reliant manageability, all those capabilities. Um, there are some, um, you know, I believe there are some PCIe lanes that we took out to make room for that drive cage. Um, so there are some features that we defeatured. Uh, but for the most part, they're pretty close. Good question. Any other questions on, on that? That was more hardware questions than I expected to get out of this audience, <laughs> frankly. All right. I'll go tell my server friends in Houston about that. Awesome. All right. Okay. I'll hand it okay. back to you. Awesome. Thanks, Joseph. Really good. Um, and I would just want to uh, pick up on a comment that you made about um, workloads and how important workloads are. Uh, you know, Joseph here presented a family of servers that you can, to a degree, you can pick and choose and use what you need and tune it to your specific workload. And that's you know, part of what we mean when we talk about a cloud optimized solution. We can certainly, and if you go at the end of this presentation, we'll give you a website where you can go and download a white paper and you can read up on our prescribed reference architecture. So, you know, based upon HP's experience running public cloud with some of the same types of hardware using OpenStack, we've taken that knowledge and we've distilled that into this optimized solution. But that doesn't mean that's the only way you can build this solution. You know, Joseph talked about the 4200, he talked about the 4510, two different options for servers. And actually from HP, even just alone, there's a lot of different options for servers. You can use the DL380, for instance. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you can build this based upon your workload requirements. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a very important point. Uh, as you design your solution, uh, tuning it, uh, the hardware, tuning the software to the specific needs of your workload is very, very critical. So let's talk a little bit about the networking that goes into this solution because, again, it's a turnkey solution. It includes everything you need to be able to rapidly deploy. We prescribe uh, two different types of switches, uh, one for the data plane and one for the control plane or the management plane. Uh, the HP 5900 top of rack switch, which uh, we configure with 10 gig. It's, it supports up to 40 gig, but we uh, configure it for 10 gig. And this is for your data plane. So this is between your proxies and your, your object storage servers and uh, even out to your public client network. Uh, for the management plane, though, we don't need as much bandwidth. And so we recommend the, the 2920 switch from HP here, uh, which has one gig built in, which is just fine for a management plane. I mentioned uh, the importance of data security and encryption, and uh, we didn't forget about that when we developed this reference architecture. It was one of the key things that we understood uh, in the marketplace. So we worked together with uh, Joseph's team. We architected a solution to address that particular requirement uh, to be able to provide on-disk encryption using a special controller from HP, the P431 Smart Array Controller. So with this solution and together, you know, one of the biggest challenges in performing this is uh, keeping track of the encryption keys. And uh, HP has a product here called Enterprise Secure Key Manager, which you can use together with this P431 controller uh, to create an end-to-end -end, uh, encryption solution that you can also use to manage uh, the encryption keys. So it's really a nice solution if you have requirements around data security. Any questions, either on the networking components or the encryption components? Okay. And the nice thing, if you've worked with Swift, you know this, uh, but the nice thing is it's a very scalable architecture. So as I need additional performance or as I need additional capacity, I can add additional proxy nodes and I can add additional object storage nodes independently. Now there are some rules, and if you go read our reference architecture document, you'll learn about some of these guidelines, I shouldn't say rules, but guidelines for how you scale. You know, one of the key things in an architecture like this is maintaining balance in the system. And so um, you can read about that, again, in the uh, reference architecture document. 
So all this is great. You know, we've spent some time talking about hardware. We've spent some time talking uh, you know, about the various components of the system. But what does it get you? What can you do with it? Um, what we're trying to do now, now that we have a solution like this, providing object storage, is start to add application support around that. You're going to do something with this object storage, obviously, right? Uh, it may be, and we see these as some common use cases. There's lots of different use cases for object storage, but we see these uh, in the customers that we work with and talk to, we see these as kind of emerging as the main focal point ones today. Uh, the first area is just a general content repository. And some examples here, you could be in uh, the media and entertainment industry, you could be in life sciences, you could be in healthcare, financial services, it doesn't matter. You're in a business where you're generating lots and lots of data. And I've actually heard some of my customers call this a digital parking lot. I just need a place relatively inexpensive, massively scalable, fairly reliable that I can put this data and I can come back and get it later. That's a content repository use case. The next area, and it's interesting if you go out and talk to a lot of different organizations, one of the biggest concerns of CIOs and the IT staff is the prevalence of Dropbox in their organizations. It's a real big problem for them. And so we work with a lot of customers who are trying to battle this problem and repatriate that data back into their organizations. And this is an area called File Sync and Share. And what we're doing here is we're working with some third-party uh, software partners, uh, Cetera and Gladinet, to create solutions to address this particular problem. So now, not only are we delivering the basic object storage functionality, but we're also going to be able to deliver this file sync and share. So everything you know about file sync and share, Dropbox, you know, with access from a mobility devices, collaboration and sharing on a worldwide basis, that's what our enterprise file sync and share is, and that's what these solutions are. Cloud storage gateways. There's not too many uh, people who are deploying object storage that don't have a need for backwards compatibility with traditional NAS types of systems. It could be NFS, it could be SIFS, it could be Samba, it could be, HT, it could be FTP, it could be you know, any, any number of different legacy protocols. And so we're working with some partners here to develop solutions to address this particular requirement. The one I have listed here is uh, Panzera. And finally, a very popular use case for object storage right now is uh, bringing down the cost of cloud backup and archive, and even more importantly, reducing the latency of uh, particularly cloud restore, cloud-based uh, restores of data. Um, and so these are four different solution areas where we've been working to take this content depot cloud optimized solution and really use it for, uh, for use cases, real world use cases. A little bit more details in terms of the file sync and share use case. Um, you know, I already talked about providing mobility access, um, being able to uh, repatriate that data back into the organizations and ensure security, but also auditability. <clears throat> and then finally, enabling team collaboration on a worldwide basis, being able to share files and collaborate um, not only within organizations, but with external partners too, and doing that in a secure way. And as I mentioned, we're working with Citera and Gladinet. Now there are a whole list of uh, actual partners that are working with HP Helion on this type of a solution. And what you might want to do if you're interested in getting more information about this, uh, go out to the HP website and look for the HP Helion Ready program. It's our program where we're working together with partners like Cetera and Gladinet to certify their software, to certify that it actually works with HP Helion. And there's quite an extensive list already of different software partners that HP has worked with uh, together with Helion OpenStack. So if you're interested, Feel free to go out there and get some more information, and certainly feel free to contact myself uh, if you want to get more information. I mentioned backup and restore, and most modern day backup software now supports the capability to be able to back up not only to traditional tape-based or disk-to-disk -disk based types of devices. Now you can also back up to the cloud directly using uh, object storage containers. Uh, a feature that HP's data protector added in version 9.01 is an ability to go directly into a menu and specify 
an object storage container to back up to, and then Data Protector, as it's doing its backups, will use that as the target. It's really a nice feature. You can also use that together, and this particular slide shows using it with a product from HP called Store Once. Store Once is a disk to disk uh, uh, storage platform uh, meant for uh, disaster recovery backup types of applications. One of the nice things about Store Once is it includes integrated deduplication technology, so you can dedupe your backups. And if you know anything about backups, deduplication is one of the key pieces of technology you want in your backup systems. I talked about gateways and how important that is to provide backwards compatibility for traditional NAS protocols. And uh, we're working here together with uh, Citera on uh, some uh, cloud gateway offerings as well as Panzura, and in addition to others. And we have those, again, listed on our HP Helion Ready uh, website. Again, it provides a seamless transition for traditional NAS-based protocols. Uh, but there are also additional features that are built in typically uh, to these types of solutions that can allow you to do like tiered storage types of uh, implementations. Uh, you can even plug into multiple different private or public clouds using these, uh, these types of solutions. So it's really a nice, uh, it's, it's a nice way to provide backwards compatibility, but also give you a lot of flexibility uh, going forward. Real quickly, I want to talk about a couple of uh, customer use cases that we at HP have been working with on deploying these types of solutions, in particular the Content Depot solution. The first one is an organization called Be Beijing Union, Union Read, and they are a, um, they're an open source service provider based in China. And they chose to go with Helion OpenStack, and in particular OpenStack Swift, in a very similar uh, configuration to Content Depot to build uh, uh, open source storage solutions for their customers. And uh, they are looking at aggressively growing their business. Um, they want to move beyond kind of their core customer base, which has been in a very um, specialized market. They want to grow that out into adjacent industries like healthcare uh, and insurance and other industries. And so they chose uh, HP Helion strictly because of that, because we were able to partner with them and we were able to help them put in place a solution that was gonna grow as they needed to grow. And another customer that we've been working with is called Okinawa Crosshead, uh, based in Japan. And they also are a service provider uh, servicing SMBs throughout Japan. And they have a product called NASDA Cloud, uh, which is an OpenStack system uh, for public cloud control and monitoring. They, as part of the solution offering, wanted to build a disaster recovery solution using OpenStack Swift. And again, they chose to work with HP because of the maturity of the HP offering and what we could do with them to help them grow their business long term. So they deployed uh, a solution using Swift and using a configuration similar to Content Depot for their object storage solution. So it's really exciting to see you know, these types of real world use cases come together and uh, people de successfully deploying uh, OpenStack Swift using a lot of the things that we talked about here today. So I want to open it up. That's actually all the slides I have for today. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments, anything you want to talk about regarding Swift or HP and our involvement? Yes, and if you can come up to the microphone, please, that would be great. And I do have some of our technical experts here today, too, if we, we can go into the technical details if you want uh, to. I would like, yes, to comment that, uh, well, you are working on, you are focusing on OpenStack Swift, which is an open source solution. And why don't you, for example, for the file syncing, why don't you consider an open source solution such as on cloud? Yes, it, great question. So the question was, you know, why don't we consider open source solutions for some of these file sync and share? And yes, we do. And I believe we have some of them listed on our HP Helion Ready website. Um, I think you mentioned OwnCloud. Uh, yes, that's one of them uh, that we've, we've worked with. So yes. In fact, in my organization, we use Swift as backend for OwnCloud. And well, it does have some issues, but it 
kind of works. Yes, I think I think with Own Cloud there were some uh, issues with licensing, and that's why we didn't do like an official commercial uh, productized version of that. But you're absolutely right; you can use it, and it, it does work. And people has a are. There's a lot of functionality already built in, and you don't have to rely on some other company to develop like Calendar and just kind of apps. Yep, makes cool. sense. Right, Great feedback. Excellent. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Well, I thank you very much for your time today. And uh, like we said, please go and enjoy the, the HP area. Uh, sounds like there's lots of free stuff. Um, and Cody can give you more information. <laughs>